Good morning, everyone. This is Chaitali Bragg from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe. War games enable decision makers to anticipate moves and counter moves and foresee their consequences. It is an old military concept being put to use in a newly emerging strategic decision, making scenario in defense and aerospace. Today, we have with us the co-founder of Insight Technologies, a pioneer consulting firm in aerospace and defense collaborating with experts to achieve the desired business impact. It is our pleasure and privilege to welcome Mr. Rajiv Chib in ADO's chat room and understand from him the effective views of this old age military strategy in taking right business decisions, both economically and with a positive perception. And to take this discussion forward is editor ADU Sangeeta Saxena. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much, Shatali. It's an extreme pleasure to have the three gentlemen we have on the panel with us today, each of them an expert in his own field. And it's a real privilege for us. So welcome all three of you to the show. My first welcome, of course, is to the oldest here. My association goes back to Amitsar, you know, for the days which have been really, you know, when I was in that youngish stage and he was one of the experts of defense finance. And that is how I got introduced to him. Welcome, Amitsar. It's such a lovely, uh, you know, occasion to be with you on the same platform. Saurabh, sir, Thank nothing you to say. Most welcome, sir. And Saurabh, sir, nothing to say. You have seen it all, huh? The Ordnance Factory Board getting converted. And then you, you know, the last time we spoke, I think it was one of the most beautiful conversations we anyone could have heard on the Ordnance Factory Board. And sir, absolutely welcome. I mean, I it is a real privilege to have you here and have you both of you here for one very valid reason that uh, the re recent war game had two of you coming out as the best speakers which is a thank real, you. real pleasure. You know, thank I you. always feel there's a list of experts, there's a list of speakers, and everybody is absolutely good and best in their own right. And to choose out of them, I think Rajiv Ji had a tough task. Rajiv Ji, welcome to ADU. You are the one who's the man behind it. The man, I will not say man behind the war game, but man behind the concept is giving everybody a real thought, food for thought. And we are here to, you know, understand from you what it all means. And, you know, uh, everybody, uh, Rajiv Ji just got introduced by Chitali. Let me tell you, it is a lovely association ADU has had with, uh, you know, this uh, insight energies, having consultants, having a, you know, wonderful concept. I, for one, you know, always thought that it was in the absolute concept which was there in the exercises of the Indian army, coming from an army background. And I suddenly realized that, yes, when I was uh, studying MBA, I realized that, yes, it's gone into the business management. And now, of course, I'm seeing it live and it's really wonderful. Uh, most welcome to the show, Rajiv Ji, Saurabh Ji and Amit Ji. And we will now begin with Rajiv Ji. Rajiv Ji, we want you to talk and tell us about this baby of yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sangeeta. Yes, so war game is a role-playing simulation of uh, any dynamic situation, right? And uh, with this finding, decision makers can make better strategies. So with a business war game, we go several years into the future. We allow the participants to experience the future dynamics what can take place, and therefore to develop foresight. And it forces the participants to make decisions and respond to the external environment. So that we can see whether we can test the robustness of our assumptions. So we can use it in a large number of situations, either it is to test a strategy or to develop a contingency plan, to ascertain a geopolitical fallout, to understand competition, to understand consequences of a regulatory policy or to test a policy decision or to gain insights in any complex uh, government procurement programs. So that in a nutshell is what the war games are all about. And uh, we have been conducting uh, this last from last year onwards. We have conducted a few for corporates and we have conducted a few generally on general issues uh, for the government. 
which has been one on the ordnance factory board then we had whether the p75i will succeed or fail because that is again a very complex program on submarines and now we were worried that there were too many penalization cases happening on ops and we suddenly found that 100 million uh, dollars has already been levied on the offsets which are worth 13 billion dollars or so. those are the contracts which have been signed now 13 billion dollars is the contract signed that is fine but only 3 billion dollars has been audited now if 3 billion dollars has been audited and we already have so many penalizations then what will happen in the future when the other the remaining gets audited so there might be a exponential increase in penalties and which is possibly not a good way of showing or doing business in India. I don't know. And that is what is one of the aims of the government. So we wanted to find out that why is this happening? What are the reasons of non-performance which are leading to penalties? And can we find a way out? Uh, so, so that's how we went about it, uh, Sangeeta. So is there anything else I would be happy to answer? And during the war game, it was excellent to have uh, renowned people who have been working on the defense offsets uh, during the service years. And, uh, and, and let me congratulate uh, Amitji and Saurabhji for being voted as uh, one of the best, uh, two of the best contributors. That Thank is you. actually very wonderful. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, just that, you know, when you sit here on a platform like this and you try to understand, uh, well, you know, it does, uh, it, it is, it's a huge ecosystem uh, which is being created. There's a very, very big private sector which has come up. And, uh, you know, when, with the already existing and in par public sectors, being a part of the complete defense manufacturing and you know transfer of technologies and make in India and now the Atmanirbhar Bharat. Uh, what I want to understand is uh, from you, do you feel, Rajiv ji, that these subjects do not have an input from the expert, uh, you know, people in the field? And uh, do we need to form a bridge between the government and uh, these experts who might have retired, but they have this plethora of knowledge and, uh, you know, it could be just the right thing. So is that a bridge which is required? And uh, when you do such sort of an exercise, do you also send all the recommendations to the ministry? And how does the ministry respond to such a war game? Yeah, okay. So that, that, that's a, a lot of questions, uh, Sangeeta, today you have, what you have thrown up. So what we feel is that just because uh, people have retired, it doesn't mean that their experience can go waste, you know. So after putting in 30, 40 years of service, we feel that there is an experience here which, is, which can still be uh, used, used for various purposes. And this experience is very, very vital. And this is what we are tapping. And secondly, what we are creating is diversity because we are able to get uh, almost every stakeholder, you know. So we have uh, diplomats, we have bureaucrats participating, we have uh, in the Ordnance Factory War Game, even the labor union participating. And it may not be possible for the government to get such a kind of a crowd or to have the time to carry out such an analysis over a period of two days or even three days or five days that is uh, our organ extent to that much also uh, so what comes out when uh, the think tanks are there when the diplomats are there the bureaucrats are there the services are there each and every stakeholder which is concerned with that war game aim whatever it is so when everybody is there under one roof and trying to find a solution, we are finding that solutions do emerge and they're very sensible solutions. And now, as far as the government is concerned, I would say that our earlier war games have been, uh, they have taken the findings very positive. Now, it might have certain times negative undertones also, but then it's a reflection of the policy. And we try to show that this is what is going to happen from our side. So, 
So in one of the war games where we predicted that a 7.5% increase will happen in the ordnance factory war game and the prices, it did happen. So after three or four months, when you were called to the Ministry of Defense, they asked that, how did you come to that figure of 7.5%? I mean, how, was it, how did you come so accurately? Uh, so we explained them the reasoning. And secondly, we also told them about how certain ammunitions will stop getting manufactured because now the corporates are answerable to their uh, shareholders. And therefore, if the, if the quantities are less, then they might stop manufacturing. So therefore, a surge capacity policy was also formalized. So, so it helps, definitely. That's what I feel. And, but it has to be taken in a positive way. And uh, those, at times, there are some negative ones what we have been doing. Uh, right, right. Absolutely, Rajivji. And uh, from uh, here, we take the conversation ahead uh, to both our expert panelists who are here, who, uh, you know, have their own fields in which they have, you know, those 40, 45 years of experience. And uh, we'd like to begin with, uh, you know, somebody who's just seen a very major split in his organization, in his previous organization. And, uh, you know, how has it affected the defense offset, sir, uh, Saurabh, sir, when it comes to, uh, you know, Ordnance Factory Board, which had a major share of uh, manufacturing. So how, how is it going to affect their manufacturing? And what about their offsets? Uh, where Because now you have, you know, Make in India with a, with a, with a very major foreign market. And you have your uh, foreign OEMs who are there who are forming partnerships. So how has it affected? How do you feel it has affected? Uh, and those seven companies will be able to match up with the expectations of the first file ordinance factory board, sir? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sangeeta ji. You see, ordinance factories were not very active in defense offsets. Uh, they got a few contracts and uh, they were basically as a buyer furnished equipment for uh, naval ships, some guns uh, to be manufactured by Navy, which were in any case, uh, ordnance factories were supplying to Navy. But otherwise, uh, they were uh, because of the mindset issues, because of the procedural problems of signing MOUs and all those things, which was required and being a government department, people are always questioning that how do we sign MOUs? and signing MOU will require so much of approvals from the government and others. So they were not active players in offsets, although the opportunities were there. We got uh, certain, uh, I'll not say contracts, but uh, partnerships, but uh, those projects were ultimately abandoned. There were certain very big projects, but those projects were ultimately abandoned by the Indian Army. Uh, so uh, nothing worthwhile could happen. In the, in the new avatar as corporations, now the companies are free to uh, sign MOUs freely and they will be forced to look for more business opportunities for the for their uh, growth and for even for their survival for better capacity utilization. So I think now it gives them a better opportunity to utilize offsets. But unfortunately, as I came to uh, know during the offsets game that it has uh, the new offset policies are the scope of offsets is getting reduced because the threshold of offset has become high. So I do not know whether the, they'll be getting more uh, opportunities in the new new setup in the way that the, I anticipate that the new offset contracts or new programs with offsets uh, may slow down. But as a procedure, yes, now they are more empowered to participate in offset contracts rather than when they were purely a government department. Right, absolutely, sir. And uh, Amit, sir, when we uh, speak with you and your absolute expertise on defense finance and then trying to understand that where does you know government come in when these offset clauses come into play, and you know, obviously they are theirs, but then what happens is there uh, there has to be a, an association between a foreign OEM and the Indian partner, whether the Indian partner is a defense PSU or a private body like LNT or Mahindra's or Tata's. 
so how what how does it happen how how do they manage what is the what is the plan of action for the mod for uh, defense offsets well thank you very much uh, see uh, you asked the way the government fit into the entire scheme of things in so far as offsets is concerned uh, my answer to that is that there is too much of government there in the sense that right from the uh, as a matter of policy uh, you know every contract which is uh, for more than 2000 crores uh, excluding now the uh, uh, contracts under the intergovernmental agreements and fms and so on uh, these all carry uh, you know offset obligation unless uh, this is uh, i think even that uh, provision for uh, exempting certain categories has been done away with uh, so the government steps into the scene at the time of ao in itself because it, it uh, prescribes the requirement of offsets in a particular contract and thereafter throughout the process whether it is uh, uh, making uh, the oem uh, you know customize the proposal to meet the mod's perception as to what is acceptable whether it is in terms of uh, you know the process of implementing the offset obligation or monitoring the offset obligation imposing the penalties government is everywhere so the entire thing is actually there is as i said you know there is too much of government there at every step in the entire process there is government which i think is uh, uh, to be very frank is problematic i agree with absolutely what you are saying sir and uh, you know when we uh, it, it's it's entrenched it, it's entrenched we cannot uh, you know we, even if we try i think at least at least it's going to take 100 plus years or even more for uh, you know in a country like india which is a major buyer uh, which is also now in the process of manufacturing so or uh, trying to manufacture and uh, defense being a field where you actually feel that you know the government wants everything in its own so i think that definitely makes a difference we do need the private sectors to come up they can have their clauses of secrecy and they can have everything and uh, you know work hand in uh, hand which is i won't say hand in glove because when we say hand in glove it has a negative connotation but uh, let's say you know working partners so i think definitely that makes a difference so so when you were in this war game what did you feel when you were uh, you were so many of you who are from their own fields experts and were all brainstorming there what did you feel what are the best recommendations you feel could be given to the government of india so that you know they open their uh, you know uh, eyes and ears and take uh, cognizance of what is happening and what they can expect to happen and then make things easier for themselves as well as for the absolutely burgeoning private se uh, sector in the defense industry so see uh, well i am put it this way the first of all there is a need to have a fresh look at the desirability of continuing with this policy of offsets as was mentioned earlier i think by mr saurav kumar i also mentioned it that you we are in a situation where the number in the last say 18 uh, uh, i think the first contract was signed uh, in 2008 so from 2008 to 2022 in 14 years we have signed 57 contracts which is an average of four, uh, four per year almost right and initially as you know the threshold was 300 crores which was raised to 2000 crores only in 2016 so despite that low threshold etc etc we have just signed about four contracts every year now that the threshold is 2000 since 2016 all single uh, source cases are out Uh, uh, there is there will be no uh, you know offset obligation and there is so much of emphasis on make in india which would mean that you know these contract will not in any case entail any any offset i think that the time has come to give a fresh thought uh, a fresh look at the desirability of continuing with this policy which is if i allow to be very frank you know uh, it, it, you know nobody is happy the oem is not happy the indian offset partners are complaining the mod is complaining is only interested in imposing penalties uh, so so you know who is happy in this game except for maybe a couple of uh, iops who have got business uh, but otherwise uh, you know it's, it's problematic 
and there is a cost to implementation of offsets, which nobody talks about. Initially in 2005-06, when the policy was introduced, it was a conscious decision that the government will uh, bear this cost of uh, implementation of uh, offsets. But, uh, you know, now nobody has ever worked out, nobody has tried to find out how much are we paying and whether what we are getting in return is worth the while. So my first recommendation would be to give a serious thought. I'm not saying stop it, but certainly give it a very, very uh, dispassionate, objective thought, number one. Number two, I think there's a tremendous problem with the policy itself. Uh, uh, this has been my view right from the beginning, but in the initial years, you know, one could uh, one could overlook it because, you know, things were sort of developing and, uh, you know, one could excuse the policy makers for not being very clear. But since 2012, when the first major revision was carried out, I think in July or August 2012, you know, things have not really uh, stabilized. Every now and then somebody comes up with, you know, some problem or the other. I could name uh, a lot of problems. Uh, the OEM have been complaining that it's very, very difficult to do business here. So why is it that despite, uh, you know, the MOD being aware of all the problems, we have not been able to set right the problem in the, uh, in the policy. So we need to, and why is it happening? Why is it that we are not able to do this? My answer to that would be that the, uh, there is consultation, there's no doubt about it, but it is among uh, the, uh, it, it's between the MOD and the stakeholders who beyond a point cannot be too frank. Uh, the OEMs cannot be too frank. The, the IOPs cannot be too frank beyond a point. The industry associations cannot be. So you, the MOD needs to engage with people uh, who actually uh, have no extra grind, and who can, who can uh, call a spade a spade and say that, you know, this is where the policy is absolutely uh, uh, oppressive. For example, just to illustrate, uh, the uh, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but uh, it says that beyond the period of performance of the offset contract, there will be no cap on penalty. I mean, how can any OEM be expected to function uh, in a situation where, you know, there is unlimited liability? And this is just one, one of the simplest examples. So the, the, the MOD needs to, uh, you know, engage with people who will be critical of their policy, who will be critical of uh, uh, you know, uh, what is being done and how it is being done. And the MOD itself will have to carry out a dispassionate analysis of what has gone wrong and why. And then only something can be done about the policy in case it is decided to continue. The third point which I comes to my mind is that, uh, uh, you know, there is excessive control, which I mentioned earlier. Why, if it is the, uh, the OEM's responsibility, incidentally, Offsets are not a financial obligation of the uh, of the OEM in a, in a in a very broad sense. It's an obligation of the OEM, which uh, which pertains more to doing business in in India uh, to 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 strengthen the Indian defense industry, right? So it is not a financial obligation, but there is excessive control. I mean, I have all I have been saying for a very long time that if the policy says that the OEMs are free. To, to select the IOP and they're free to, you know, uh, to design their proposals, then why should it be that the MOD comes into picture for approving the uh, offset proposal? So obviously there is something terribly wrong with, uh, with the stipulations in the offset policy. So this excessive control for changing the IOP, for changing the, for uh, rephrasing the offset implementation, everything has to be improved, uh, approved uh, by the MOD where the decision-making is, is extremely problematic. Uh, and lastly, for the monitoring. Now, if, uh, uh, and for the time taken in taking decisions. If, for example, somebody gives a proposal and says that, you know, this is what I want to do. If the MOD is going to take, uh, say, several months to decide whether it can be done or it can't be done, and then says, no, it can't be done without even assigning a reason, it's going to be very difficult for the OEMs to, uh, you know. So this demonitoring, uh, the uh, mechanism for monitoring and the way uh, it is being monitored and the way the claims are being audited, all this requires a thorough, thorough uh, overhaul, uh, very, very close, very dispassionate, very objective, very honest uh, rethinking. One actually wonderful point, sir. And sort of, sir, we will take off from where Amit sir has just left that all this requires a very major change. And, uh, you know, 
another point which I feel, which uh, I'm sure I leave it to your expertise, uh, that uh, these foreign OEMs are here to do business. Now, when they're here to do business, offsets is a part of it, transfer of technology is a part of it. And uh, they have everything on a platter now laid out by the government. So why the cribbing, sir? They have everything ready for them. So uh, let's understand why are they cribbing about it? Well, very interesting question, Sangeeta ji. I will uh, also uh, like to fall back on my experience because when this offset policy was being written, we, we were interacting, we in the MOD were interacting with large number of OEMs. And everyone was coming with its own suggestions and very big companies from US and UK, they, they were discussing with the joint secretaries and other uh, people who are in the part of the offset implementation. It was part of uh, policy framing. I'll not say policy, it was procedure framing, they say. But uh, from the cases that I have seen now, I feel that the problems which were there in the original, they have continued, rather they have magnified. One of the things that I find is that there is a huge perception gap between what the OEM feels it's an offset. They come with some experience of having offsets in other countries and they expect that, okay, this is the offset which is ac accepted by so many other countries and we have a different expectation. And that, that has not... Be been narrowed actually that has widened given the type of uh, cases which I were all which I will all presume which Rajiv brought as cases were actually all the real life situations. For example, TOT. Now it's a very very ambiguous thing. What is the meaning of TOT? And we become very ambitious when we uh, when we talk of TOT. We are always talking of design know how. And many times it is the DRDO where uh, we go for TOT. DRDO has its own expectations because they will not naturally not settle for simple things. So that uh, creates its own push and pull and pressures and there is no reconciliation or meeting point. Secondly, uh, there is an inbuilt, uh, to be very frank, there is an inbuilt uh, contradiction within the Indi Indian offset partners. When the offset came, all the big industries, they tried to corner the offsets. Leaving, there was virtually no way to, they wanted MSMEs or small industries to enter. Some way, some uh, leeway was given, the requirement of licensing was withdrawn. But still, I think we have a hierarchy that we give too much emphasis on certain high-tech type of offsets. And if something is so-called low-tech, simple manufacturing, then we say, okay, it can be done by India. So why we should take it as an offset and all that. I think that is not the correct approach. Offset is giving business if we are, uh, if it comes, the business comes to MSMEs or small industries, we should be welcoming it. So uh, I think we, there was, uh, we had our own perceptions about offsets. We had our own uh, uh, priorities that it should be going there. It should not be going there. And uh, the implementation portion has uh, been, uh, I will say, not up to the mark. One aspect was that there were a lot of changes with every offset policy. Now, every co offset contract from the date a vendor submits his offset proposal, that is along with the bid, to completion of contract, we must take a time frame of 8 to 10 years. In 8 to 10 years, at least 4 amendments to the offset policy will come. Now, nobody knows which offset policy is being implemented, which is not being implemented. And there were uh, cases when there was uh, some uh, lack of uniformity uh, that, okay, this will be accepted, this will not be accepted, this was there in 2008, this is not there in 2012. So all those things also has led to a uh, lot of confusion. And uh, overall thing is that I will, I feel that uh, uh, the complete setup is definitely against the concept of ease of doing business, which the PM is, uh, has been repeatedly emphasizing. You are very correct that what is the need for uh, what uh, Amit sir said that uh, why is the need for acceptance of offset proposal, sir? I can, I can share my experience with you. Of course, uh, the ABOD was insisting, the senior bureaucrats were insisting. I was just a director at that time. And why the 
foreign oems were keen on this because they said ki we do not know what decisions you will take we do some offset and after 2 years you come and say this is not an offset so please tell us beforehand because offset is a very uh, in a very generally worded language it is written and there is huge scope of interpretation so it's a, it's a it's a gold mine for a bureaucrat actually to just to say this is an offset this is not an offset and we do it without assigning any reason because we have not evolved our own internal uh, guidelines for doing offsets which should have come in public or we should have been at least giving a speaking orders but uh, that has not been done so it, it has created lot of uncertainty in the mind of uh, offset partners and this uh, question of penalties and all that has created a sour taste in everyone's uh, mouth so sorab sir you know in continuation to what you just said i just wanted every all of us to understand one point which is also uh, you know rajiv ji was telling me has been a part of the recommendations that documentation of negotiations and talks between the, the government all stakeholders government o foreign oem or the supply chain partners uh, there is something lacking in this documentation now what is this one one of the complaint from the oems was actually excessive documentation for example uh, what i came to know was that if if they are listing an indian company i think we require all the documents hundreds of pages of print out which is available in the site of ministry of corporate affairs we can just go and say it's a company it's a listed and listed registered company that's all but perhaps uh, we are asking for the complete uh, print out of all the documents and they were showing the truck load of documents now secondly some things are should have been there for example some guidelines for decision making or some faqs we could have come up with so that it it becomes very clear for the oem that okay this will be considered as an offset this will not be considered an offset and once we start writing such documents actually it clears our own mind ki okay if what happens if this happens what happens if this happens so once we start writing it's not easy to write such documents the faqs their answers or the guidelines because then the internal contradictions come out very clearly in that process and perhaps we can deliberate within the mod could have uh, deliberated on it and come up with far more simpler guidelines which is there for everyone to see now there is nothing of that sort there is a plain procedure and uh, the oems are not uh, clear how it will be interpreted and offset partners uh, indian offset partners are having their own understanding of the thing and that uh, there is no meeting room and it appears to me that if we are taking 3 to 4 months for taking a decision there is not even the iu the oems there is no such setup that even they are having they can uh, have a regular discussion with the mod and clarify things that's what the war game uh, revealed so it it, it is something uh, which will not uh, promote uh, this uh, the type of cohesiveness which was expected it became in a far more bureaucratized manner right sir and uh, sir before we continue to the next step i one thing which i wanted to understand in continuation to the point you were making was that do we need to train all stakeholders when i say do we i mean the government of india because the clause is its uh, uh, the offset clause is its the transfer of technology is uh, according to them so do we need to train these people the the private uh, manufacturers the indian companies in the supply chain the foreign oem don't they need some sort of training on the indian per se offset requirement which you know when they come they are at a loss then they try and study they try and read so can we can the government of india create a platform where this sort of a training can be given to all stakeholders you see training uh, as such you do it's not a special skill that requires training actually it's a, it's a very common sense business friendly approach that is required to be taken which appears to be was uh, not there and one of the thing is because the people were referring to a very scathing audit by the cag in i think it happened in 2010 which scared lot of people and everyone became very defensive because it pointed uh, out towards some uh, loopholes and other things now in a government setup these are very natural but uh, these taken these can be taken care of if we come with a elaborate faqs 
with some elaborate guidelines ki okay if say transfer of technology in want cases it will be acceptable this is the minimum scope we so that everyone understands more or less that this is what he is supposed to give us and this is what we are supposed to demand we we as i can tell you from my experience we always demand for design know how which no one gives but whenever there is a tot offer we will ask for design know how these are things which should not have happened but and then the discussions keep on continuing for years and years and and the pure the common sense decision making that we do we take four months i do not know anything should not take more than a week to decide there is not a legal matter or constitutional matter that we are deliberating and thinking uh, reading case notes and all those things it is a common sense business decisions which are required to be taken that were not right. been taken right sir and amit sir uh, continuing uh, from where uh, saurabh sir has left uh, is there a concept of dispute resolution which would be helpful sir Yeah, before I answer that question, you know, the, you raised this question of training. If you permit me, I I would like yes, to say absolutely. something about absolutely. it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. See, the point is that this question that you asked presupposes that the MOD is absolutely clear as to what the policy is and how this is to be implemented. Uh, I am afraid that's not the case. So I'll give you an example. You know, for the last ten years at least, if not more, uh, this question whether a wholly owned subsidiary can be an IOP or cannot be an IOP. is still hanging on so you know at, at different points of time different people gave different answers i asked this question in a seminar and the answer i was given was first they said you have been in the ministry you should know and when i said no i don't know then they said no you read the policy it's mentioned who is who can be an iop who cannot be an iop so at the point i'm making i'm not making fun of anybody but what what i'm saying is that there is lack of clarity i don't blame anybody Uh, but the fact is that there is lack of clarity, and where it is very very clear, we still want some uh, you know saying the matter. For example, uh, in Indian offset partner, right? The policy right from the incidentally in the initial years there was some confusion because if I remember correctly in two thousand five DPP there was just one paragraph. I mean there was no procedure was evolved at that point of time. So initial years. as i said earlier you know you can uh, you can sort of uh, forgive uh, the system for not being very clear but once you know it started getting refined and a stage came very early uh, when the dpp said that the uh, to be an iop you there have to be just three conditions one it has to be an indian company it should be compliant with the fdi and licensing norms and thirdly i think it should not have been barred by mod now what is unclear about it so why should mod get into the question whether an entity which oia wants to uh, take as, as iop requires uh, mod's approval in so far as uh, you know what will count for offset what will not count for offset you look at the list the elaborate list if there is some lack of clarity it should have been clarified in that list in so far as faqs are concerned uh, i mean i think the several years back a set of faqs were uh, sort of uh, issued by the mod you will find it very difficult to locate them on the internet and they should have been actually incorporated in the main policy so unless there is absolute clarity in the mod itself there is no question of training and that mr saurav kumar said i agree with that that you know it doesn't really require any training it's just a matter of common sense it's just a question of taking decisions which is what has been the bane of the offset policy as indeed all matters related to acquisition etc now i'm sorry i forgot the question you asked i uh, i was asking you sir uh, whether a dispute resolution uh, 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 could be created a uh, facility for that could be created uh, as per the recommendations and uh, yeah certainly what could be done about it yeah certainly it can be created but again the, the point is that when we sit down and start talking about the modality of creating this uh, dispute resolution mechanism will run into a difficulty even for main acquisitions you know the the standard contract document very clearly says the arbitration clause starts with the with the statement that you know all disputes will be uh, resolved mutually uh, through discussion etc but it's always one sided for the simple reason that nobody in the mod will have the uh, have the courage Uh, to take a decision which is pragmatic 
I mean, nobody would ever want to take a decision which can be questioned by CNAG, by uh, CBI, by whatever, you know, several years after you have taken the decision. So this mechanism, what kind of mechanism can be put in place, uh, whether it can, it should be a, a ministerial mechanism, etc., is something which requires, I mean, I will not be, answer, be able to answer that question, though I have some views in the matter, but it, 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 it will certainly have, uh, if, and that's a big if, if it is properly constituted and its mandate is extreme, absolutely clear. Uh, yes, sir, absolutely. And uh, what I feel, uh, which I feel would be the best way to, uh, you know, close the discussion would be uh, to ask all of you uh, one by one as to, is there a point apart from all that you've spoken till now, which could be a win-win situation for all stakeholders in the defense offset uh, policy and clause. So we'll begin with Amit, sir. Well, you know, uh, the problem is that I, I have my own biases and prejudices. I, I don't think it's a good idea to continue uh, with the offset policy. In fact, I, I'm reminded of a song from an old movie, uh, Gumra, which says that so, you know, if we, if we have not been able, like, you know, look at the, look at the question of critical technology. For several years, DOD, DRDO has been wanting to acquire critical technologies. I really wonder if any OEM has ever offered a, a critical technology to DRDO, but we still persist. We have actually enlarged the list in DAP 2020. So if things are not working, then we should we ought to actually look at uh, the the desirability of continuing with it. But uh, since you know in government of India, once you start something, oh, file never closes. So uh, you know I think it will be very very difficult for anybody in the MOD to take a call on this and say that no, uh, we are going to dispense with it. So what can be done, I think, and what should be done is number two things. One was tried out actually in I think in 2018. Well, when I was in service, actually, which goes back, to, I retired in 2012. Uh, one of the things I used to peddle, one of the ideas I used to peddle was that, you know, if you are not happy with the proposals given by the OEM, which is why you go on talking to them and, you know, forcing them to change their proposal, the better option would be to stipulate what is it that you want from the OEM. So let the, let the offsets be MOD driven and not OEM driven. And actually in 2018, if I remember correctly, MOD actually came out with, uh, with a draft policy, but then, you know, like many other policies and reports and so on, idea, it was shelved. So if we want to continue with this, then one option is to make it OEM driven, like many other countries, UK and several other countries. Uh, it, it's left to the OEM and subject to the offer being accepted. So don't say that you know, this is my policy, this is what I want, you know, this is uh, the eligibility of IOP, etc., etc. No, make it simple. You make an offer, if it is acceptable to me, I'll accept it. Or you demand it. You say that this is what you must give. If that is not possible, then uh, uh, as I've been saying throughout this discussion, simplify it. Simplify it to the bare minimum. Just say that, you know, you can discharge offset obligation through these three, four avenues and make them very, very absolutely crystal clear as to what you mean by those avenues and then leave it to the OEM. Whether he wants to do it, do it with the IOP A, IOP P, whether he wants to change the IOP, whether he wants to rephase the implementation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, don't focus too much on penalty. But today, the entire focus is on penalty, penalizing. As if, you know, that is going to uh, you know, achieve the target uh, or the objective of uh, the offset policy, that's not going to happen. It is counterproductive. So just focus on, uh, on simplification of the policy, reduce it to just two pages, say that, you know, whatever offer you want to make, these are the avenues through which you can discharge it. And subject to this, uh, you can choose your IOP, you can phrase it the, in, the, in the way you want. Don't insist that everything should be done in the initial year. It is not possible. So if somebody is doing it in the later years, what is the problem? I mean, some people come out with the, the net present value, it creates a problem. All this is, you know, I, to my mind, these are very, very 
outlandish argument. So simplify it and create a system where people can take decisions. If the decisions can't be taken, then the offset policy will continue to limp uh, the way it has been limping all along. Thank you so much, sir. And Saurabh, sir, we'd like to continue with well, your idea I, about I, a win-win situation. I, I agree with uh, all the points which Amit sir has said. But uh, from my experience, I can uh, share two, three things. One is that debate was there in the initial years also that let OEM be on the driving wheel. But it was uh, the MOD uh, people who were in the, uh, involved in the decision making, they said we cannot give them freedom, otherwise they will not implement, they will come out with excuses and all that. So there has been an element of suspicion, maybe in some cases it could be correct. But ultimately, it is the obligation of the OEM. We should not uh, uh, restrict his choices under any circumstances. That, that's number one. Number two is that we fail to understand it's a business. And people who take decision here, they do not know that if I have to develop a vendor for manufacturing, it's true how much efforts it takes. Because people have never worked in an industry. So we keep on giving a very, very outlandish is the word <laughs> which Amit sir has used, net present value. So every VI, it should be like that. It's not as serving food that, okay, this is the thing. Or it's not a running industry that I am milking cow and giving it. You are asking me to develop a source here and he is going to use most probably for his own product some, somewhere else. How he can do it? How he can do it? He has to develop that vendor that tell him and in the process he shares lots of technology for which he gets no credit at all. The entire manufacturing setup, the entire quality control setup he explains. He gives that and he doesn't get any credit. It's got huge value. So we are never... Uh, able to understand that how much efforts it requires when you develop a vendor, when you do offsets. And these things are valued by everyone, every OEM values. If the time is coming soon, when we will also be asked to deliver offsets. In fact, when OEB got the first order from a country for supply of 155 mm shell, there was a requirement of offsets. Being an intergovernmental agreement, we were given waiver, but there was a requirement of offsets. Now, once we will start giving offsets, then we will realize that what we were asking, the same thing we will not be able to fulfill when others ask us to do so. So it is. it should be a very business-like approach, a simple procedure, full freedom to be given to the offset partner. And we should be very clear what we, there should be no grading that, okay, making a small components is something like a low cost thing and doing designing of this is very high cost. This is inherent in our thought process, in our decision making. And we discriminate very badly against smaller companies, people who are manufacturing small components. I remember we got an order from Israel and, and there was an offset. He said, we would like to have packing boxes for those missiles. There was a huge Allah Gulla in MOD. Are, how can we get the packing? So, baksa hai, without realizing that even a box for the simple INSAS or 7.62 mm ammunition has such a big... Uh, mill standard that the box is supposed to be humidity proof for 20 years in its life. But we, our concept is box is a box. is a suitcase. So we were not uh, that much business friendly in our outlook. We were not friendly in our outlook. We never appreciated the effort required in doing offsets, in searching new vendors, in searching new businesses. And that is why there has been uh, such a big... Uh, gap. And of course, the worst has been that we have been fiddling with our procedures every two years. So there is no stability what, what we want actually. And as sir has said that a subsidiary ka matlab kya wo das saal mein to kahin kisi ne likha nahi. It depends upon the person who is on the chair, how he interprets it. So these were the things. It, if it is simplified and, and we must do it because it will be it will the problem from MOD, it is going to go to MEA and then in some cases uh, to even higher offices, PMO also, because people will be complaining. People will be complaining. It can't be left. It, uh, it tarnishes the reputation of big foreign companies. So, so it's better to manage it. However large the fire looks, somehow it should be extinguished here itself. Absolutely true, sir. And which also means that, you know, ease of doing business does not remain a mantra. It has to become a reality. 
So we talk so much about it, but how much in the real sense does it exist is what we are trying to find out. And now we go back to the man behind all this brainstorming. Rajiv ji, back to you. And uh, wanted to understand from you that after all the experts have put in all their brains and come forward with a very good set of recommendations, uh, out of these uh, how positive are you that uh, how many do you feel which will, will be you know absolutely uh, ex uh, accepted by the government of india and uh, mod and uh, they feel yes this is a great recommendation yes uh, thank you sangeeta uh, so what my feeling is that now offsets are going to die down in the next four or five years because the D dap 2020 does not leave any categorizations for offsets. So the new cases will not be coming, but the penalization in old cases are increasing. So something is going down, that is the new cases, and something is going up, that is the penalization, imposition of penalty in the old cases. Now that is where the fire is, and that is which has to be extinguished. And there are certain penalization cases which are reached a stalemate situation, where neither the OEM does anything, there is inaction on both sides. And that is why we're not able to close the offsets. So I think from my, uh, from one of the recommendations uh, which came out, that this is where we should concentrate in these legacy stalemate cases first, as a first step. Now, if that has to be done, so therefore more avenues and more time and a second chance has to be given to, to uh, the OEMs, where there's a stalemate right now. And they're not able to do in as per the old regulations. So something has to change and somebody has to give. Now, whether the MOD takes it on themselves right now or they put a dispute resolution body which takes it on their head, but whatever it is, a second chance has to be given. Now, that was a unanimous opinion and is a recommendation which I think should be accepted to douse the fire so that from 50 open cases, we reduce it to 25 open cases for the, in, the, in the near future. So in case, even if we do that, I think we'll be taking a step forward. I think that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, it's a subject which really is endless. And uh, the sort of expertise we have with us in the country uh, you know, I really feel that one discussion is not sufficient. And uh, we'll keep continuing with these discussions on the subject, sirs. I'm really, really thankful to all of you to be here on ADU's chat room. Uh, thank you, Amit, sir. Thank you, Saurabh, sir. Thank you, Rajiv ji. Wonderful to have you all here. And now I take you back to Chetali, who's waiting in the European studios of ADU. Uh, Chetali, back to you. Thank you so much, sirs. It was really a very interesting discussion, a very wonderful panel of experts that we had today and a very insightful, of course. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And thank you, ma'am, for taking the discussion, discussion so interesting with your questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot and have a nice day ahead, sirs. Thank you. 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 Thank you.